I'm not going to use slides today, just I've got a few simple things I want to get across and then maybe we can have a bit of Q&A. But um, if there's one takeaway today, you may wonder what the symbol is here. This is the emblem of the Transhumanist Party, which is a registered political party in the UK now. Uh, today's theme, what I'm going to be talking about, is sustainable abundance as a political program. So what has politics got to do with everything we've been talking about today? We've already heard a bit about politics, actually, regulatory frameworks and so on. So um, actually, it's not as much of a leap as I was expecting. But first, I'd just like to stop and think about, just for a moment, what does a positive future, you can think of you can, different ways you can frame the idea of sustainable abundance, what that might mean, or what a, a positive outcome for society means to you. Um, I would say most broadly, in an ideal situation, what we'd be looking for would be a situation in which we have a freedom from want, so our, our major needs are met as individuals and as a society, but also that we have a freedom to pursue our, our personal potentials and our potential as a community, so as Stefano was saying, to, a, not, a chance to pursue greatness, and also uh, not just to find that, uh, to pursue that potential for ourselves, but for the people we want to share our lives with going forward in a journey. So think of things as a, a journey for you individually and for civilization. And that sounds quite aspirational. I just think it's worth taking a moment because quite often um, I was introduced as a politician. I'm not a politician. I've never had anything to do with politics in my life. But we've set up a political party but we're coming from uh, a very aspirational place, I might say, and we've started as transhumanists, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. But the transhumanist idea is the idea that you can uh, be more than merely human. You can be better than well. You can go on. Your life can be to have something uh, to be something that has incredible meaning and a lot of potential. And that maybe at this point in our lives, we should take a moment to think what you really want as an individual, what you want for the people you love, and what we would like to have to share as a society. Now, so what's that got to do with transhumanism? Well, I am a transhumanist, and this is something that I imagine only a small proportion of people, even in this room, would, would feel inclined to say out loud. But um, I've done this once before, and it was an interesting thing, so let's try it again. I'm going to ask you two questions, and I'd like a quick show of hands. First, do you believe that it is possible, forget about the moralities or the ethical implications or legalities, but do you think it is physically possible to improve the human condition in any way through technology? Do you think there's anything about... Yeah, hands up. All right, overwhelming. If there's anyone who doesn't believe that, then they're being quite shy about it at the moment. <laughs> now, so given that you do, as a room, believe that it is physically possible to improve the human condition through technology, now assuming that this improvement is voluntary, that's something I'm going to say is, is necessary, do you then believe that we should allow people the opportunity, if we had the technology to improve their lives through technology, should they have that right? Put your hands up if you believe so. Okay, again, you're all transhumanists, thank you for coming. <laughs> and it might sound like a strange word, but that is the essence of it, that we can and should improve the human condition through technology. And you agree with that, so I'm glad we don't have, to have to that debate, that's great. But uh, one of the reasons I need to kind of, I felt the need to start by touching on the basics there, is um, I was particularly invigorated to hear Steve Fuller giving a talk where he was talking about transhumanism and saying some really bold stuff. And a lot of it was the kind of thing that was really common in transhumanist circles about 25 years ago, which I find myself thinking on a fair bit lately, since today we're thinking about what's happening 25 years from now. 25 years ago, <coughs> it was really common for transhumanists to think in terms, and speak in terms of really big ideas. You know, we, we weren't even talking about society and social justice. We were talking about you know, dismantling small moons in order to get over to the next solar system and that kind of thing. And, you know, we were getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. Nowadays, we realise that there might be one or two things to deal with on this planet first, which is okay, fair enough. But So, sometimes people hear this word transhumanism and they think, well, that, what's that got to do with politics in the world and so on? And we've heard a lot of other talks uh, today. We've, Callum Chase, for example, was pointing out and, and Rohit started the morning with basically a, a panorama of torrential change that is coming down in our lifetimes. And it has the potential to mean good and bad things in all sorts of interlocking, unpredictable patterns. And it's up to us, basically, to take what we can from this, this pattern of change and make the best of it that we possibly can for our own sakes and for those of our children. Now, that might 
seem like a given. Okay, we accept change, we do what we can with it to make our lives better. That sounds you know, fairly obvious. Except that a lot of people in their actual daily lives, and if you look at the attitudes reflected in the newspapers and debates we hear between career politicians, they mostly would prefer to pretend that change doesn't exist until it's upon them. Or actually, in reality, sometimes until it's a wee way in the rear view mirror. And they go, oh yes, that thing that became a reality about 10 years ago, maybe we should start talking about the ethical implications. That's not good enough when you're talking about the kind of change that we're going to see in the next 25 years. So, if that's transhumanism, what's the transhumanist party? Now, so this is about the idea of taking these technological notions of improving the human condition and adding politics into the mix. And people have mixed ideas about some of this stuff. Some people think it's a good idea, some people don't, some people think it's necessary, some people think it isn't. Uh, I will go out on a limb and just say I believe it's inevitable. The reality is that we are walking into a transhumanist world, whatever you want to call it. And it's, a question, it's just a question of whether or not we come into this world with our eyes open or whether we sleepwalk into it. Whether or not we stop and think about our values in a world where so much technological change is happening and so many other change trends are peaking over the next couple of decades and we think about what, we're, what we actually want to do about that. Now we live in a society where legalities and political and social realities change. Uh, they, they, they can limit or empower us when we're thinking about what we want and what we can get. And when we're making changes in our society, we need a bit of time to deal with change. We need time to pass new laws, to make sure they're going to be effectively enforced, to find the funding for these things, even to think sensibly about new problems. So we need to start working on these problems now. You can't have people uh, suddenly coming out of the woodwork, making the necessary changes out of whole cloth two decades down the line, by the time we need problems to be desperately fixed before that point. We need to start working now while we can still have a sensible conversation. And there are all sorts of organisations that are thinking about these things within <coughs> universities and mainstream political parties and various think tanks of all sorts of types. But we sometimes need people to take a really bold stance in order to remind others to move out of their comfort zones a little bit. Even if we're not ever going to be the ones making big decisions for society, Sometimes a loud voice is required to remind people that the next 25 years are going to include more change than the last 200, and that's an extremely conservative estimate by a lot of the standards that I dare say people in this room know about. So broadly speaking, I, in my personal view, the trans transhumanist party is an aspect of what you could call political transhumanism, which is to say the part of the transhumanist society, that, uh, transhumanist movement, I should say, which takes politics and social realities seriously, thinks about them in a serious way. And the point of view that the party represents for me personally is I, the, the term I use is social futurism, which just means that it's taking the reality, social realities and technological change that's on a revolutionary scale and pace and thinking of those things in the same space, thinking about how social change and political change and legal change affects technology and how those technologies in turn affect society, laws, ethics and all the rest of it. And a lot of the time we see increasingly with companies like Google, Uber and so many others we've talked about today that if we're not prepared to think about these things in advance and take the problem seriously then the problems get dealt with without our say so. Suddenly the whole notion of us being a democratic society it just disappears. We're not making the decisions anymore. Someone invents the new way forward and your opinion doesn't matter. So we need to think about our principles, to what extent we think individual citizens and experts should have a say, to what extent politicians should be are thinking about the right things or not thinking about the right things. So we've created this party that's existed in the UK for uh, eight months now and some people say well there's no need for transhumanist politics um, because politics is a slow process and a lot of quid pro quo and it hasn't got any time for these big ideas. I would say that politics in the current paradigm is like that. Right now we live in a society that has not yet taken these ideas seriously enough. 
But if the level of change we've been, we're hearing about in meetings like this, if this is real, if this is something other than just a way to while away your Saturday and have a nice little fantasy for yourself, and I believe it is real, I mean, there are so many changes here that for the, all of them to be complete fantasy would be pretty remarkable in its own right. If, these, if this level of change is real, then we need a whole new paradigm, a whole new way of doing things. Uh, personally, I don't like the idea of people who have no scientific training, who base their policies around ideology and not evidence. Their idea of rational argumentation is to shout at each other waving small pieces of paper. For them to deal with a rapidly moving technological problem that could change the lives of millions or even billions of people, it's just unacceptable. We owe it to ourselves and our children to do something better than that. Now, so, so when people say to me that, oh, transhumanist politics, that's never going to fly, what I would say is that transhumanist politics is going to happen one way or another. By the time you get to a society that's worthy of being called a transhumanist society, or you can put any label on it you like, you know, a rose by any other name, as they say, but if you've got a radically technologically empowered society, and there's still politics, and it's hard to imagine a society in which politics is completely evaporated, then you're living a world in a world in which transhumanist politics is extremely, extremely important. And at this point, you still have a chance to have some serious influence in what it means to have a transhumanist politics, to have some input into the debate about what kind of policies a transhumanist politics should be particularly concerned with, what things shouldn't it be concerned with, what's important, what's not, why. There'll be a time when everyone will be clamouring to be involved in these, these discussions, and you'll have had a chance to be in that debate in a particularly loud way, and it's up to you whether or not you're involved. I'm sorry to be so blunt about it, but that's how it is. You've got a window of opportunity, but then so has society. And I would say that the first window of opportunity I'd like to think about is with looking at the next 25 years, since that's today's thing. It's so the next five years. I would, in terms of the party, the way we're looking at this, <coughs> Particularly, we've got our inaugural party day tomorrow, so if you want to know about it, um, come up, have a word with us, or look up the Transhumanist Party in the UK online. But we're having a, a party day here tomorrow, and one of the things we're doing, quite markedly, uh, deliberately, is to have our policies decided upon by the membership. So we have certain principles um, that were decided when we were setting up the party that make sure that any policies we have are in line with our notions of what a transhumanist party should be, and none of them would surprise anyone who's been listening to the talks today. They're very much in line with the kind of, the kind of ideas that have been expressed this morning about uh, rights for sentient beings, uh, suffering, basic, uh, basic income, universal income guarantees, uh, questions of automation in the workplace, foreign relations in a world where you have drone technology accelerating at a great rate, surveillance and intrusion uh, into people's personal lives, control over their own data, all that kind of stuff. These, these are important issues for people who are thinking about rapid change in the next couple of decades. But in the first five years, it seems to me that it's particularly important that we have principle-guided but membership-driven policy. So anyone who joins the party is able to propose a policy and it has to be addressed by the party. So there is, there is an, a small group of people somewhere who say, well, we should believe this, this, and this, and this, and everyone else can just sign up and then eat their popcorn in the back row and be happy. No, the idea is that you join and you tell us what you think this conversation should be about. If enough people agree with you, and you are more than welcome to go and rally them in meet-up groups and so on, and tell other people why you think these things are important and why they should get involved and tell us, then that's what's going to happen. Now over five years of that, as we have more and more outreach and scaling up, and I'm not going to tell you about that here, if you want to hear about that you can come along tomorrow, but over the next five years we've got a lot of outreach trying to um, thank you, uh, connect with other groups, uh, and we're already doing this, um, and setting up also concrete initiatives, working with think tanks and other political parties. This isn't about trying to get people into positions as MPs, this is about trying to make things happen on a broad scale through any channel we can. Getting these conversations started, getting people thinking about what they can practically do, not just through the party, but through their own groups, through their own institutions, through their day jobs, through the groups they start up. It's basically like a mutual support network where people are reminded what we should be working on together and what kind of principles they should be thinking about. 
But after the first five years, very broadly, I would characterise the 10 years following that as a time of turbulence. We're going back to Callum's talk this morning. I don't know how many people saw it, but I would say that in a period from 2020 to 2030, can I have a quick show of hands? Who did see Callum's talk this morning where we had the stadium? Okay, right, so I'm, you all know what I'm talking about when we talk about a, a stadium filling up <coughs> with water. I believe that between 2020 and 2030, we are uh, effectively talking about a society that is the, pe the spectators in the stadium who have noticed water on the ground. There is 7% water in the stadium. It has been filling up for 45 minutes. There are four minutes left. That's roughly the world we're living in between 2020 and 2030, in my estimation. And I'm, I'm not psychic. I'm not putting on my court prognosticator's hat here. I'm just saying that on the balance of probabilities, there are a number of sizable and convergent factors in technology and society and resource management and so on that look like they're probably going to converge over roughly that space. If they don't converge in that time period, then there won't be a hell of a long time afterwards. So there are a lot of big issues, that, cans that cannot be kicked down the road any further, if you see what I mean. Now after that period of turbulence, the next 10 years, I think, is where we... Well, actually, we have... You can, you can shuffle these things around any way you like, but let's just say that as well as, as, well as a kind of a singularity beckoning in that situation and all this, this turbulence, in fact, is playing into each other in, in unpredictable ways, we're going to have, right now, uh, we had a, I forget whose talk it was actually, but we had, um, we had Gandhi on the screen before, so first they, they ignore you, then they laugh at you, and then they fight you, and then you win. Well, I think we're, we're um, seeing enough groups with different agendas but who are interested in similar sort of issues who have been ignored, have been laughed at, and now are being responded to in pretty harsh terms. But we're going to see serious, serious fight back. I mean, at the moment, um, the only time you, you have a tendency to get locked up for talking about this kind of stuff if, is if you're Edward Snowden or someone or Julian Assange or someone who's gone out of their way to do something particularly prick, prickly to the establishment. But I can imagine uh, quite easily that as these issues get to be bigger and bigger, just being an activist and being loud about them and being involved with them and, and pushing for particular types of change is going to naturally get a response from people who don't like all this change of these various types and who are trying to push back, who want to dial it back, to dial everything back, ideally, to some point in the 20th century or the 19th or the 18th. We can see them now. There are so many issues in bioethics, which essentially boil down to people saying, I don't like the modern world. Mm. Now, I think Steve was right. Transhumanism is not about people who like the modern world. We're about people who stand up and say the modern world is not good enough. We want the ultra-modern world. We want things to be better. We want them to be better by every metric we can possibly lay our hands on. That's what we want, and we're unapologetic about it. We want a better life for us and for everyone we can help. Simple as that. It's not the kind of thing that's very trendy to say these days. It was maybe trendy about 120 years ago. Uh, and then a lot of bad things happened in the 20th century. But we're back. <laughs> and we're saying that we unapologetically want progress. What we're also saying, and this is also not very trendy these days, is that you are going to have to work for it. You cannot sit back, click like on Facebook and say, oh, progress, that sounds good. You go, guys. No, you have to get involved. You create your own groups, you tell us what we're up to, you tell us what we should be doing, then what we can do is tell other people, oh hey, you guys should work with those guys, and we put you in touch with each other. <laughs> Basically, it's an exercise in networking, setting goals, deadlines, and making things happen over the next 25 years, which sounds like a long time, but there is a hell of a lot to do. So um, I'm going to wrap up now, but just the last thing to say is that in... Um, in this, this world of political transhumanism and the Transhumanist Party, we're, there are a lot of different ways we can do things. We're not locking ourselves down into one solution, and there's a lot we want to try to do, and we're in the earliest of early days. As I say, this party in the UK has only existed six months, and we've got a 25-year game plan. If we haven't had any significant influence in 25 years, then I think the game is well and truly out of our hands. So, if it was ever in our hands, we'll, we'll see what happens. But I'd like you to think about what you could do to be involved. Now, obviously, I'm an activist. I would like to tell you to join the party. Just actually just get involved in the most blunt, simple, come along tomorrow, tell us what you want, and then we'll tell you how you can help and we'll work it out together. But it's not as simple as that. It's a networking thing. 
you are already involved with groups and organizations who wants very, very similar things. So let's work together. Invite us along to talk. We'll invite you along to talk to tell us about what you're doing. You're probably developing some excellent technology that we want to tell somebody else about. You probably have funding or need funding. Almost everybody has or needs funding. And we would like to put the people who want the same things as us in touch with each other. Basically, we want to find everybody we hear about who wants the kind of things we want, and we want to help them in any way we can. We won't always be able to do it directly, but if we're plugged into a wider community, then we might just be able to make a difference, and that wider community is you. So, the last thing, the last little note, and this is a, this is a note on, uh, if you, it would be really easy to walk away and go, oh, that, well, that's a nice idea, but I'm going to forget about that. I'd like I'd like you to stop and think again about why you need politics. Most people would like to ignore politics because, frankly, contemporary politics is boring and irritating and involves David Cameron and David Miliband and all the rest of them. And, uh, Jeremy Corbyn is slightly more interesting, but you know, there's, it's not the most interesting thing in the world, politics, as a rule. What I want you to think about is all the stuff you're excited about that brought you to this meeting. Now, for some of the more more adventurous of you, it might be something like cryonics, but there will be other things you're involved with, as has been mentioned earlier, that often fall into shades of legality. You know, oftentimes you could do with the thing you're interested in to be a little less illegal, or, um, <laughs> but, or, or simply just to have some funding. Maybe there's a technology that you think is extremely important, and I've heard at least half a dozen mentioned today, that could do with being subsidised by the government. Or at the very least, you could do with someone on your side running legal interference so that the thing you're interested in that you think is very important doesn't get banned by someone just because they got on their moral high horse. If you think you might need that in 20 years' time, help us now. It's too late 20 years from now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any questions? English has a fantastic distinction between politics and policy, yeah. namely that you have this long, uh, long-sighted view of politics, uh, where you can find strategies, etc. And perhaps it's not well done in a political party at all occasions, if nothing else, because you need to get into parliament, you need to win, but. Have you also, you were talking about outreach to think tanks, associations. Are you preparing something uh, for policy production? Because some of these questions are, uh, of these issues are so typical. Oh. The industry 4.0 versus the 3D printers. Yes, yes. Um, um, you can badly discuss it in Brussels. Absolutely. Uh, the simple version, um, obviously, the, you know, Giving a talk like this, I want to keep things simple, and so I refer to the party like it's a monolithic organism. But um, the reality is that we're embedded in a network. Transhumanism before parties was particularly good at think tanks, and there are organisations that were own <laughs> being one of them, of course, that are to varying degrees developed at this kind of thing. So for the most part, we don't want to try to reinvent the wheel. We want to support our friends who are already working on that kind of thing, some of whom are avowed transhumanists and others who are more like on the fringes. And we do have um, explicitly political think tank type groups. We have the, the recently formed Transpolitico, which is closely related to the party. Uh, there's a new transhumanist <coughs> policy centre, there's the IET, and there's your own group and the guys at Oxford. And um, Now, our policy is basically to work with all of them as channels and to treat issues on a problem by problem basis because we're not in a position to do anything via Parliament now or anytime soon. But that said, it doesn't mean we can't potentially approach problems. In terms of policy production, um, the idea is to try to get as much uh, advice as possible from these kind of organisations that are already geared up to this kind of thing, but then to run it through the process of the party when it comes to officially sanctioned party policy, which means that it's it will have come from people who've thought about these matters in great depth initially. It will definitely be on side with the party's principles, otherwise it can't have made it through the process. And then finally, it will have to have been voted into approval by our membership. Uh, 
so far, I mean, we've already got policy voting in progress as I speak, started a week ago, closes tomorrow evening, it seems to be going really well. So um, this is going to be a process maturing over the years, but so far I think we're off to a good start. A big part of it's going to be listening to, to people who are doing this already. So. Amen, could you explain the iconography of your flag or symbol? Why the black field, the star, the Ouroboros thing, and the, the uh, six-sided field? Well, I haven't seen it as, a, 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 as an Ouroboros, but um, the, the hexagon was coming from originally from sort of 1970s uh, futurist, gosh, I'm name on the tip of my tongue now, who, Dyson, Freeman Dyson, who had Dyson spheres, and the idea of an optimal shape in nature. Um, but the whole, the whole thing was voted on by the membership, so it wasn't anyone's, any particular person's choice. Um, between me, you all, and everybody watching on the internet, this wasn't my choice. <laughs> but that said, um, and also the, um, so the outer field was in order just to have some contrast and we went for this optimal shape in nature, it's like the most rational shape in nature. The, um, the symbol on the inside is the symbol that was adopted by the uh, Transhumanist Party in the US, except they have an H+. According to Electoral Commission rules in the, U in the UK, you are not allowed pluses, ticks, crosses, or anything remotely resembling them. So we went through kind of asking our membership, what do you want? And the star was apparently quite popular. And I've made my peace with it because it's humanity to the stars, that kind of thing. But, Frankly, there's not a lot of symbolism in it at all. It's just striking and it makes people ask questions like that, which is a great way to start a conversation. <laughs> oh, that said though, um, I've got to admit, there are a few people who like to come up with some colourful theories about this stuff. I've heard some fabulous stories already and we haven't been going very long. Um, so, you know, if, if you ask the right person, I'm obviously a high-ranking member of the Illuminati. All I, can say is that, all I can say is that the Illuminati doesn't pay half as well as I'd like. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, um, as a transhumanist, would you agree or disagree that uh, intellectual property rights and by association uh, technology patents are probably the greatest barrier that we have right now to technological innovation? I draw a distinction between what I personally believe and what the party endorses, uh, just as a matter of rule and ethics. Personally, I agree with you. The party, I'll know whether it agrees with you this time tomorrow. Um, but um, we've got, we made a point of explicitly including that as a policy. A little more dryly worded, but that was the, essentially that freedom of information and software patenting would, only, uh, would be limited to cases where it could only be most clearly justified to basically rule out patent trolling. Um, this is... This is the kind of stuff you can only get away with saying if you're a radical party on the fringes. Um, because, you know, if, if we were suddenly at number 10 tomorrow, people would go, how the hell does that even work tomorrow? But the whole point is that what we're trying to do is point the way toward the way things should be soon if we don't want the wheels to fall off civilization. You know, not just that issue, but a number of others. But yeah, um, I agree wholeheartedly, and I'm hoping that this time tomorrow the party will endorse that point of view. Um. I'm interested, you, you described it as a principle guided, a party decided, uh, roughly, and I'm just wondering how that's actually uh, different from, from Corbynism. And um, really, if you're looking for your 7% you've, you've noticed that the water's rising, yes. there's 100,000 who've joined the Labour Party, surely, in the last three months. Shouldn't, I, as, a, as a recent member of the Labour Party, I, I you might look at the transhumanist to join the Labour Party. Yeah, I mean, this is your insurgency, this is your I invite the transhumanists to join the, this is your insurgency, it's happening now, uh, and you can get on board. Okay, I, may, I, may I answer your question by, by actually alluding to another question which has been asked a lot. During the formation period, we, we made a point of, we went out of our way, bent over backwards repeatedly, in order to ask people what they thought. We wanted to be as transparent, as inclusive as we could be in order to start as we meant to go on. There, after a while, you have to start drawing practical lines, and we have a party constitution that decides who gets consulted and what, and blah, 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 blah. But it meant that there were a lot of very lengthy conversations online. And two recurring conversations that came up, um, one, questions that came up again and again and again. One was, why have you got that logo? No, it wasn't even that logo. It was whatever logo we had at any given moment. It was, why have you got that logo? quickly followed by, and did the lizard people ask you to use it? <laughs> the other question is, um, why are you called the Transhumanist Party? Why don't you call yourself the blah, 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 whatever? And my answer to that, I think, answers your question. 
Apart from the fact that I don't know what Corbynism is, um, I mean, you know, I can guess, but right now it's too early for me to know. The Labour Party, if they truly start out with principles and then develop their policy by consulting with the membership, sticking to their principles and using evidence rather than ideology, then hats off to them. But their principles will be those of the Labour Party. We are transhumanists. We will start with transhumanism first and foremost, above everything else. So you can start out being left wing, right wing, up wing, I don't care. Before you get into the details, in order to agree with us, you're probably going to want to feel some degree of sympathy with the worldview of transhumanism. Now, broadly speaking, as I said before, the, transhumanist, uh, the worldview of transhumanism is a very broad thing. But for us to simply say, we throw our lot in with the Labour Party, would be fundamentally offensive to those of us who are not Labour supporters. Now, I'm, a, I'm relatively partial to the Labour Party myself, but the Transhumanist Party is not the Labour Party. And between you and me, I don't see what's happening in the Labour Party as an insurgency. I think it's an interesting development. And with that, thank you very much, Amy. Thank you.